the deliverance which Jesus will uh, give to us when he returns, it will also be a time of wrath for those people who are not prepared, for those people who have not embraced Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, in this regard, we also have the responsibility to protect ourselves in the sense of having faith, having love, and having hope. So let's read, okay? Let's read First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 to 11. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation for our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Just as I said, we should not be surprised if ever we have reached the point of studying about the deep doctrines of God's sovereignty and grace. Why? Because even though you are studying about the second coming and the need to put on the helmet of the hope of salvation, you remember that? The hope of salvation, Paul goes on to explain that actually in the final analysis, ultimately, our, our security is due to God's grace. That is our ultimate security. And that is why, even though he was talking about the second coming, in verse 9, he talks about God's sovereignty. Because Paul understood that ultimately, our safety is in the hands of God. He says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is very powerful. If ever we will be secured or safe and protected from the coming wrath, it is because, and this is the mind-boggling thing, it is because God has destined us or appointed us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our ultimate security. And what is so powerful about this, and at the same time, this is something people, to be frank about it, find, are reluctant to accept, is because it takes everything out of their hands. Their faith is no longer in their hands. It is God who decides. And many people, desirous of autonomy and independence, do not like that. They want to have a say in their destiny and faith. But the Lord says, the Bible says, no, you are secure. Your hope of salvation is certain and sure because God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation for our Lord Jesus Christ. In this one verse alone, alone we learn some very mind-boggling things. Although it is not something which should really surprise us if we think deeply about it. What is it that we learn? Number one, our dependence on God is absolute. Absolute. Everything depends on Him. Our lives, the place we are born, our physical welfare, our spiritual welfare, our salvation, absolutely depends on the sheer mercy of God. But I also explained last time that even though our security and our salvation depends ultimately on this appointment by God, it does not work automatically. God has chosen to use means in order to implement His will. Okay, let me explain that. We already know that God being great, omnipotent, all-powerful, and sovereign, we already know that His will cannot be thwarted. What He has decided, He will accomplish because the Bible says, I am God. I will do all my pleasure. I will accomplish all that I please. We already know that. It cannot be thwarted. But at the same time, it does not happen automatically. Our finite human minds cannot understand why this is so, but that is the way it is. That is how it is revealed in the Bible. God has made his determination. He has made his de decision. He will accomplish what he pleases, but at the same time, it will have to be accomplished through means 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is why we need preachers. We need Bible studies. We need to share God's word. We need to persuade and convince uh, people regarding the, the gospel because God uses means. Even if, it, he, even if he has chosen and decided and destined uh, uh, what is this? The salvation of a person, it, it does not happen automatically. That is what the Bible reveals. And that is why Jesus Christ had to die on the cross. Because as I said, God is sovereign. God will accomplish his purposes, but he uses means. It does not happen automatically. And humanly speaking, on the earthly level, okay, there is an obstacle that needs to be removed before we can be saved. What is that obstacle? It is our sins. You must remember that our God is a holy and just God. He cannot just ignore our sins. Being a holy, righteous, and just God, His justice demands that the penalty for our sins be paid. Otherwise, His justice will be compromised. That is why Jesus Christ came down, this will just be a summary, and died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins to implement God's will. Now, <clears throat> A few Sundays ago, I pointed out, and even though this is uh, once again puzzling for many people, I, found, I, I, I pointed out that if you really study and understand the Bible, the death of Christ is far more powerful than you think. Many people think that he simply died on the cross. But no, the Bible says that he gave a, his life a ransom for many. He laid... <coughs> He laid down his life for the ship so that the ship will not be lost. In the same way that there is a connection between the undefeatable, indefeasible will of God and the death of Christ, there is a connection between the death of Christ and the inevitable eternal life which will be given to his chosen ones. And that is, that is the meaning of verse 10. Look at verse 10. Who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. I have no time to explain this anymore. All I am saying that Christ's death is powerful. It is meant to really give effect to the will of God of saving his chosen ones and giving them eternal life. That is why in John chapter 6, if you remember, and, and in John chapter 10, my sheep, they can never be lost. God has willed their salvation. My Father has willed their salvation. And I gave my life for them. Now, what is, the, what is this deeper understanding and more biblical understanding of the death of Christ? Which I was trying to explain a few Sundays back. <clears throat> I said, the Bible says and the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ actually paid for our sins. I do not know if you got what I was trying to say at that time. But I pointed out that the death of Christ is not hypothetical. Some of you might be wondering, what does that mean, hypothetical? I'm saying it, was not, it did not merely make salvation possible. It made salvation inevitable for those, for those people, for the sheep for whom he laid down. His life because he actually paid for their sins. And if their sins were paid, inevitably they cannot ultimately be condemned or punished because their sins were paid. That is what I meant by, and that is what the Bible means by actual payment. But again, here is again the paradox. In the same way that the sovereign will of God, although undefeatable, does not happen automatically. It needs to be implemented on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The death of Christ, although powerful and effective and actual, does not happen automatically in our lives unless we believe. Now that is paradoxical. Yes, he actually paid for our ships. He laid down his life for the ship and the ship cannot be lost. But the way God has planned it is for his people for us to believe and receive the benefits of Christ's death before we can be saved. 
If we just stick to the Bible, even if it's paradoxical, even if we do not know how to reconcile everything, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Therefore, if we do not believe, we cannot be saved. So I said this is paradoxical because do you not remember that the Bible says he has already destined, he has already appointed that we obtain salvation? Christ actually paid for our sins? So, but what happens if we do not believe? The whole thing will be messed up. The whole plan will be ruined and that cannot happen. Something must be done to ensure the fact that the chosen people of God, these people whom he has not destined for wrath but to obtain salvation, something must be done to ensure that they will believe. Because if they will not believe, they cannot be saved. Now, so you might say that is not so much of a problem. Believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is easy. But that is a human misconception. Because the Bible teaches believing in Jesus Christ in a true and sincere and saving manner as opposed to natural faith, okay, is not merely, is not easy. It's not even difficult. And now be shocked by this. It's impossible. For a human being to do that, with man, it is impossible, although with God, all things are possible. Now, some of you might object and say, how can you say that it is impossible for human beings to believe in Jesus Christ savingly? You know, I'm not talking about merely intellectual faith, but really a repentant heart that sincerely and truly and humbly, humbly surrenders to the Lord Jesus Christ. That kind of faith, the, the, the real and true faith which really saves, is something beyond our power. And you might ask, why? Why do you say that? Very simple. Because we are sinners. And here again is another thing which we have not deeply realized. We do not understand the extent of our sinfulness. That is why we think we are easy. But... Never mind what I'm saying. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. Okay, what does the Bible say? The mind. Okay, where are we? Okay. Romans chapter 7 verse 8. The mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. This is our minds before we were saved. We were in the flesh. We were sinners. Ours is the sinful mind before we were saved. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Shocking. But the next question is, the next question is, what does that have to do with faith? Okay. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.6, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, faith is something that truly pleases God. But have we not just read from the scriptures that the person who is in the flesh, that is the kind of person we were before, cannot please God? Because our hearts, our minds are hostile to God, are at enmity with God. And look at Romans 3, 10 to 12. What does the Bible say? None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Now, no one does good. Not even one. But faith is good. Saving faith is good. Save is ple Saving faith is pleasing to God. But the Bible says, no one does good. Not even one. Our hearts are desperately wicked and beyond pure. So how can we savingly believe that is the question what you thought was easy was actually impossible for sinful human beings you will only realize this and you will only accept this if you understand how sinful we really are but does not the book of jeremiah say the heart of man is desperately wicked and beyond pure? Does not this verse say, no one does good, not even one? Does not the book of Isaiah say, even the good works that we do are filthy rags? 
So how can we do that spiritually good thing, which is saving faith? How can we do that as sinful human beings? We will come to the answer later on. But before I say anything else, let me just point this out to you. Even if Christ died on the cross for our sins, actually paid, even if God appointed us to obtain salvation, as the Bible says, please remember, those are not my words. Those are the words which we read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Even if Christ obtained forgiveness on the cross for our sins, but if we do not have faith, the plan of God will be defeated and the death of Christ will be of no value. So the question now is, what is the use of Christ dying on the cross if we do not have faith? And the problem is even compounded by this. I just learned that I cannot believe on my own. That faith, saving faith is impossible for me as a sinful human being. What happens now to the plan of God and the death of Jesus Christ? How do I answer that? That is a problem. Think about that. That is a very big, very big problem. It's like trying to give a, a gift of a car to someone, but you don't give the key. Kung ano? Pagaan mo auto, pero wala yabi. Anong pulos ang auto? Hindi pagaan, hindi pagantar kung wala yabi. But here is the grace of God. Here is the grace of God. Something that most of us do not realize. Last year, okay, last year, si Mutya, nag-13, she became a teenager. And so what we did, we, were ce- we celebrated her 13th birthday. We gave her what she asked for. She wanted a gaming computer. So ginhataga namun siya, as her gift, for her uh, 13th birthday, a computer. But you know what? Kung CPU lang ang ginbakal namon, kag wala kami naghatag mouse, kag keyboards, kag headphones, wala pulos ang CPU. Do, do you understand my point? Kinahanglan, I must not only give my daughter for her to really, uh, what is this, benefit from that computer, hindi, I must not only buy the CPU, I must also buy the mouse and the power supply and the keyboard and the headphones so that she could benefit from that computer otherwise it's useless in the same way here now is the main point Jesus Christ did not only die on the cross to obtain forgiveness for our sins he also obtained the faith and the repentance that we will need in order to avail of those of the benefits of his death. Because even if he obtained forgiveness on the cross, but he did not obtain faith and repentance for us, his death would be useless for us. And his blood will be wasted, which cannot happen. Because if you remember in the book of Isaiah, the Lord said, He will see when he died on the cross, I will see my offspring, I will see them, and I will be satisfied. The death of Jesus Christ was intended to be a complete success. And in order for that death to be a complete success, he procured, he obtained, he purchased not only forgiveness for our sins, but the faith and the repentance which we will need to avail of that forgiveness and eternal life. You might now ask, Brother Dennis, where is the verse in the Bible which supports that? Romans 8.32 Romans 8.32 He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how he will he not also with him graciously, freely give us all things? If he could give us Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, how could he not give us the faith and repentance that we will need in order for the death of Christ to be effective for us personally? That is why, as I said, if you really understand the Bible, you will realize things you never understood before. What does this verse mean? Romans 8.32 He who spared not his own son, Jesus Christ died for you. He gave you his own son. He actually paid for your sins. Then he will not purchase 
and procure the faith and repentance which you will need to avail of that death? No! He who spared not his own son, he will also freely give us what? All things, including the faith and repentance that you will need to make this death effective in your own life. Otherwise, it will be pointless. It would have become an exercise in futility. But that cannot happen because as we already learned from the Bible, it was intended by God the Father to be a success. It was intended by God the Son to be a complete success. And now, that is why if you read the Bible, you will find out that true faith, your faith, the reason why you are in Christ is again a matter of grace. That is why we are absolutely dependent on Him. It is a gift. Where are the verses? Okay, let's read the Bible. Let's study what the Word of God says. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? That is why we, when it comes to our salvation, we really do not have anything to boast. In the same way that everything in our natural lives is a result of grace, our birth, our ang hangin, ang adlo, ang pagkaon, our work, everything is a matter of grace. Even in when it comes to salvation, even everything in salvation is a matter of grace. Resulta, no one can boast. Why do you boast as if you did not receive it? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Jesus answered and said to him, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. John 6.29 If ever you believe in Jesus Christ, it is the work of God. Philippians 2.13 It is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Very clear. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ. You should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Your believing in him is because it was granted to you. Not only faith, but even your repentance, which you will need in order to avail of the benefits of the death of Christ. When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Look at the highlighted words, granted repentance. With gentleness, correcting those who are in the position, if perhaps God may, grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. <coughs> the grace of God. The grace of God. We are absolutely dependent on the grace of God. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption by His doing. It is God who works in you both to will and to do even your will to believe and to repent. Now, this is going to be a short message. You are going to be very happy. This will be only one half of what of the time I usually use in preaching. I am about to end. Let us go back to John chapter 3. You might be wondering, John chapter 3 is about being born again, born of the water, born of water and the spirit. What is the relation of that to what we are studying? If you go back to John chapter 3, it says, Unless you are born again, born of water and spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And if you equate seeing with faith, that means being born of the spirit comes first prior to seeing. But today it's reversed. First you believe, then you are born again. But that is not what John chapter 3 is saying. It says, first you are born of the Spirit, and then you see the kingdom of God. Because it's logical, because as I already pointed out, we are so sinful, 
on our own, we cannot see. God has to take the initiative. The Spirit has to work first. Una gichaya per me. Una gichaya. We love Him because He first loved us. I did. You did not choose me. I chose you. You must be born of the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. That is why this is related to what we are studying. Because now, in the same way that... Okay, summary, summary, go back. It's a big picture. It's all connected. The Father decided. Okay? The Father decided. But it does not work automatically. The Son implemented. But it does not work automatically in our personal lives. The Spirit now applies. God appointed. The Son atoned. The Spirit applies. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. What does the Bible say? When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority. But whatever He hears, He will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. Now take note of this. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, He will take what is mine and declare it to you. Remember what we said, what we learned, that when Christ died on the cross, He not only procured forgiveness for our sins, He also procured the faith and repentance that we will need in order to avail of His death. But it is the Holy Spirit who takes from the treasury of Christ the faith and repentance that we will need and brings it to our heart. Christ died, yes, but the Holy Spirit delivers. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Father decided, the Son died, the Spirit delivers. The Father appointed, the Son atoned, the Spirit applies. That is the role of the Holy Spirit. And that is why this is connected to what we have been studying about the need to believe in order to be saved and the fact that it is still a matter of grace. It is the work of the... Do, do you not see that God does everything? Do you not see that God does everything? But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart or man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him, salvation, He has prepared that. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of the person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us, that we might understand through the Spirit. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. And very important, verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. <laughs> On our own, we cannot accept this, this great revelation and teaching about salvation. It has to be revealed to us by the Spirit. That is why when, when uh, Peter said, when, when Peter said, uh, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus told him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Once again, it's sovereign grace. Once again, it's the initiative of God on our own. The natural person does not, does not, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. But these things, God has revealed to us through the Spirit. As far as our sinful selves are concerned, we will never believe. We will never choose God. If God had not chosen us first, we will never choose Him. We love to sin. That is the extent of our sinfulness. But God, in His grace, appointed us. Christ died for us. And the Spirit applies the benefits of Christ's death to our hearts. 
He opens our hearts to receive what we in our sinfulness will not receive on our own. That is why in the case of Lydia, in Acts chapter 16, the Bible says while Lydia was listening to, uh, what is this, the, the, the sermon of Paul, the Bible says the Lord opened her heart. Let me tell you a story. I will close with this. Uh, mm, one more verse before I close. Okay, one more verse before I close. Uh, okay, we've already read that. Okay. Conclusion. As I said, this is short. Then I will tell you a story. Okay, look forward to the story. For we know brothers loved by God that He has chosen you. Oh, we've studied this. We've, God has chosen us. Because, how do we know? How did Paul know that, the, the, that God has chosen these Thessalonians? Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. If the Holy Spirit will not work, the word will not have a powerful, powerful effect. But the Bible says, Paul knew that the Thessalonians were chosen because the Spirit in His sovereignty, the wind blows where it pleases, in His sovereignty, the, wor the Spirit worked powerfully as they listened to God's Word. The Gospel came not only in Word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Now for the story. The story. Ma-close ma na ko na Tuod na niya. Many years ago, mga 30 to... Okay, mga 35 years ago, tigo lang na ko niya, I was a member of the Steel Waters Band. I was a musician. I was the keyboardist for Pastor Pete's... Uh, ita, Pastor Pete Itabag, kilala nyo, di ba? Uh, uh, still water bands akong nagatukar sa piano nagakanta-kanta ko we would go all over Negros Occidental sometimes even as far as Iloilo we would go to Iloilo we would have concerts in all these municipalities then after we would sing and uh, play and uh, perform si Pastor Pete since he was a very good evangelist he would evangelize he would preach the gospel okay one night Medyo ulan, it was drizzling, medyo ulan ulan I remember after we sang, after we performed, nag si Pastor Pete. But that night was very special among all the nights that he preached. Because while he was preaching, tumahibi ako. There was something different about the preaching. Nang, hindi ko maintindihan. I was of course already saved. But even then, I felt Kakalma ba lang siya magwali? Wala man siya, hindi ba siya pariha sa akin nga pala single? <laughs> Pero, he, he, he was, you know, he preached calmly, he preached from a human perspective, ordinary. Pero there was something different. I felt moved, though may hibig ko. And uh, after the sermon was over, kagin invite niya ang mga tao nga mag-come forward, di ba? Usually, amun ang katabo, no? After the sermon, uh, those who want to receive Christ, come forward. Kadamo-damo sang nag-forward. Kadamo-damo sang nag-forward. And I, I could still, I, I could see some of them do mahibi. That, that was a unique and special night. But that's not the end of the story. Because the next night, we were in another municipality, Pastor Pete, after the concert, Preach the same sermon. Pero for some reason, I do not know what word to use. Prangkana yun lang. It was dry compared to the other night. But it was the same. Almost the same, Gitya. What was the difference? This is the difference. This verse, this verse. This is the difference. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Brothers and sisters, application. Let us praise God for His grace, and let us be absolutely dependent on Him. Because everything we are, 
everything we have, our salvation, our faith, our repentance, we owe it all to Him. All of grace. All of grace. Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts to you. We praise you and glorify you because even though we are sinners and absolutely helpless, you and in your sovereignty have condescended to show mercy upon us. Although we do not deserve, none of us deserve even a single iota of your mercy, O oh Lord. But thank you, O oh Lord, that in your grace, in your sovereign grace, in your sovereign mercy, you chose us, you reached down to us, your son died for us, and your spirit delivered to us the benefits of Christ's death so that your omnipotent will might be fulfilled in your life. Lord, please humble us so that we will accept the truth of your word, the truth about your greatness and goodness, even though it goes against the, 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 the inclination of our hearts to be independent and autonomous. Help us to just bow down before your sovereignty, because you are God, we are not. You alone are truly free. You alone are all-powerful. And your will, it will be done. We submit to your will. We trust in your heart. And we praise you every moment of our lives for being our sovereign, merciful, and gracious Father. Let this be the motto of our life every moment of our remaining years all of grace all of grace praise the lord in jesus precious name amen